Yeah. All right, I figured I'd do a little video this morning. I'm working on the uh, 1776 for Victor, and uh, we're setting up the end play on the camshaft. And there's a couple things uh, to consider when you're doing this. If you're building a race motor, you know you can set this up on the loose side, uh, straight cut gears. You want to sort of tighten it up a little bit because when you have a helix cut gear like this, it's always trying to pull it one way. So it's taking the backlash pretty much out while it's running. That's the whole idea behind going to a straight cut gear. It unloads this and takes a little bit of uh, resistance out of the motor. I don't really think it's much horsepower gain. It sounds cool, but it can be hard on valve springs too. But anyway, uh, when setting this up, if you're uh, going to drive around town and you have a customer that's going to not turn a lot of, lot of RPMs going down the road, or like if they have a freeway flyer, for instance, in their car, there's going to be times where they're probably more than likely going to lug the motor. And uh, what I mean by that is the RPM is going to be probably on the low side more than the high side. So they're going to be doing in-town driving, maybe, you know, stoplight to stoplight. Uh, you catch yourself in the wrong gear and when the motor sort of lugs a little bit The cam has the tendency to beat back and forth. So if you have the thrust set a little too loose It'll knock the shoulder off of the bearing And what I mean by the shoulder, I mean this thrust surface uh, Sometimes you'll change your oil and you'll find this in the strainer and another thing on the uh, bearing selection uh, I like to try to get the steel back bearings if you're gonna you know set the thrust down because if the cam gear starts to wear on the thrust surface on the aluminum bearing it'll just wear it off and this this will fall right off into the sump the steel bearing has a little more resistance to that it's a little stronger uh, so these get pretty thin when you have to clearance them you know to get a little thrust clearance uh, a lot of times when you go to uh, put the camshaft in the motor, they won't even fit in the bearing because it's not, uh, this is too wide for the journal in the front. So you'll have to sand this on a piece of glass and get your desired end play that you want on the cam. But I try to go with the steel ones. I have noticed I have had an aluminum bearing fail and uh, I use a double thrust bearing and it was a customer that, you know, drove their bus uh, very slow, lugged the motor all the time. And uh, I found the uh, thrust surface on an oil change. Just one of them, but I suspect, you know, the other uh, one was probably going to follow behind. And uh, it was an aluminum cam bearing. And, you know, you don't think a cam bearing's got a lot of load on it and uh, aluminum's going to be fine. But it's this surface right here that will end up giving you the uh, trouble. It'll just break right off there. It's, it's uh, pretty thin. The steel one seemed closer out of the box too as far as uh, letting the camshaft turn. So if you're uh, setting your end play at home and you're trying to figure out how to do your uh, dial indicator, this is a good tip here. Uh, this is an oil plate, uh, oil pump cover. One of the aftermarket types that doesn't have a shoulder on it and you can bolt it to the uh, front journal there and uh, it makes a very good stand for your dial indicator. So I'm going to go, this one set it, uh, I set this one up at like four, four and a half. Uh, you know, it's personal preference, engine building preference and how the person's going to drive the car. I know this car will see more low RPM than it does high RPM, so I have it set up sort of on the uh, tighter side so it's not beaten and uh, yeah so that's uh, what's going on with this motor uh, come over here let's see look at me this camera without shaking you guys to death to show you what's going on on the bench so uh, we're uh, setting up the lifters they're all different sizes it seems like now uh, some of the qualities definitely you can uh, tell there's a little bit of a change in the quality. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I try to buy the best components that I can that are available to me anyway in our area. I mean, we can always go out of the box and get some, uh, 
you know, coated lifters or tool steel lifters. I understand there's that market, but you know, I'm not building an engine for at that level for this customer. So, you know, the, the typical supplies that I use on this channel is probably the stuff that you guys are going to buy to build a motor at your house or, you know, an engine kit. And, you know, you have to consider all these things. And uh, I'm not sponsored by any manufacturers on this channel, and uh, I don't get any perks. So my only uh, loyalty is to my subscribers, and uh, you know I have to start pointing some of this stuff out to uh, people that watch this channel that are building motors, and they want to have good results because uh, it's getting more and more critical to check your parts, and uh, you know people probably think that's ridiculous. I had uh, a guy that builds Volkswagen motors that came and hung out with me and uh, he thought it was, he doesn't build a lot of them, he builds a lot of LS stuff and you know he has a hot rod shop in Maryland and he was just amazed that you, you know, you have to notch the lifters and deburr the cam and you know do all these things, you, you sort of have to touch every component in the motor, you can't just take it out of the box and bolt it in the car anymore. So I'm going to show you some stuff on these lifters. There's not a lot I can do about this. Uh, it sort of is what it is. There's not a lot of stuff in stock right now. There's only so many suppliers. And uh, I saw this problem and I, I thought maybe somebody was trying to pull the, a fast one on me when I first noticed this. And uh, I'll point this out and you guys can you know, see if you notice this when you buy parts. So these are scat lifters, they're right out of the, the package and we're going to talk about the package because I don't understand that. So, uh, you know, I'm a simpleton so we're going to try to cover this very uh, on a simple basis. Uh, <clears throat> when companies start changing the way they package stuff or uh, little package stuff, that's the first thing that we notice as a consumer, you know, hey man, the packaging changed and you know why. Uh, especially when the new package isn't a better way to go. So when you used to buy scat lifters, you would get them in a nice uh, cardboard, on a cardboard sheet, and they would be, uh, you know, draw down there, and they uh, vacuum pack them on a piece of cardboard, and they would say scat on them, and you could hang them on the wall over there, you know, I could keep them in stock. People would come in, they would see them, they look cool. And uh, they were an upgrade, you know. I mean, that's why I started using SCAT components because they were just an upgrade from uh, other companies out there. People were having problems with cams wiping out, and I sort of felt like the SCAT stuff wasn't doing that. And, you know, it's not the best all-out race grind, but there are some really good grinds. I mean, SCAT has you covered from pretty much, you know, if you want a, a street car to an all-out race car. I've used SCAT cams and, you know, been pretty successful. But recently, uh, our packaging changed. Now we get them in these bags and have a little SCAT tag on them. And when I first got these, I had, uh, I helped a subscriber. I built a motor for him here and we, uh, he needed lifters. He bought a cam and he didn't get lifters. And I had a set of lifters here on the uh, cardboard skin pack and we popped them out. I, I gave him those lifters and he said he would replace them with a set of lifters and uh, I got some of these in the mail with a scat tag on them and uh, I was like wow man you know I thought Terry pulled a fast one on me and uh, found some secondhand lifters on the internet and sent them to me so I didn't use them I bought some more lifters uh, because I'm just, you know, I'm like that sort of, you know, leery when I see stuff change. And what happened was I pulled the lifters out of the container or the bag. And you can see the surface right here in between the uh, two oil grooves. We have our feed hole. We have an oil groove. We have our second oil groove. Then you have this surface right here. Well, somebody at Scat, man, is, uh, messing up because you see how thinly machined this is right here it's like a, a knife 
And uh, that's no bueno for a lifter bore. I mean, any you know person that builds motors knows the thinner you make that there, I mean, you start losing support in the center of the lifter. To give you an idea of how bad it is, here's a factory lifter. You can see the width of this. And this is how scat lifter used to be. It would have that band there, little support rail. And there it have these two oil grooves on both sides. You put the little notch to uh, connect the grooves. So we can see this is like paper thin. You know, if I had to measure that, I would say it's probably 60 thousandths. And then we have the same uh, brand lifter out of the same pack. This one's probably about, I don't know, 100. And then we got this one over here and it's almost normal. And then we have a normal one. Look how fat that one is. I hope you guys are seeing this. You know, I don't know if I'm gonna get it or not. But anyway, this is a problem. Uh, you know, it's like, wow, I bought these lifters, I bought the cam, and then uh, I ran into another problem yesterday that was really uh, pissing me off. So I got these lifters here out of the cabinet and they're the same way. So it looks to be like there's three good lifters in each package to me and the rest of them are all, you know, cut wrong. But I paid the same price for them. You know, and I, you know, I'm not going to take these back to my supplier because it's not their fault. You know, uh, I bought them, but damn sure going to be looking at them in this bag for here on out and seeing what that groove looks like. So, you know, I'm going to have to put two sets of lifters in this motor to get one set, you know, to uh, build it where I'm going to be happy with it. Well, <clears throat> let's turn the camera back around. But let's really quickly show you that, you know, I'm not using a, uh, you know, set of calipers to measure this stuff. I actually have, you know, stuff to measure things. And uh, I was just measuring the lifter bores with this inside mic. And uh, one half of my case is acceptable. The other half is a little on the, uh, you know, the outside edge of where I'd like it to be. So I have a little more, a little more clearance between the lifter and the bore than I'd like. The other case is wiped out though. So uh, I really have no choice but to use this case and, you know, pray before I assemble it and hope that, you know, the Volkswagen gods look down on this guy and, you know, let him get a little life out of this. Engine cases aren't something we can get right now, and uh, this guy's pretty deep uh, in these two motors, about 10 grand. So uh, I'm trying to help him out here, but you know, one side of the case, the side that shouldn't be good, the side that doesn't have the oil in it, you know, is uh, nice, and the uh, cam, the other side, the stud side of the case, is a little bit uh, on the outside edge. But uh, that's not the problem that I ran into yesterday. Let me show you what I ran into yesterday. Let me turn this around. So, uh, you know, a lot of people think you just throw these motors together, you know, you just bolt it together, right? And uh, that can't be so far from the truth anymore. Um, yesterday, I've learned if you guys build motors and you want to take any advice, I know some of you guys think I'm an idiot, but if you're building motors at home, you really need to, uh, the first step that you do is, you know, of course you clean everything, you lay everything out, you do this kind of stuff, set all your clearances, measure everything. But uh, I've started to bolt the camshaft in before I assemble the engine. That's my first process now. Uh, I don't try to put the crank in here anymore and assemble the engine, put all the lifters in, oil everything up, uh, silicone the case. I just can't do it anymore. And uh, it's because stuff does not bolt together anymore and it's just getting worse and worse. Now, we mentioned that I like a certain brand. Well, I had a customer here buying a motor yesterday, a little, sold a little 1600. And uh, he was watching me fight this. I put this motor together six times yesterday before I could get the cam to turn. And uh, I have a large box of bearings. You know, I built a lot of motors, so I keep bearings. If they look decent, I keep every bearing out of every motor. So I can use them for fitment or whatever. You know, if I need to test something or, you know, 
a lot of times the cam bearings are good and lately if you buy two sets regardless i have a lot of bearings a lot of new ones and uh i had to go through the box you know and i'm going through the box trying all the bearings and i'm i'm getting nowhere you know and uh I have to be honest with you, I didn't measure the cam. You know, I, I just assumed that it was a bearing issue or the case. You know, when I torqued the case down, the, the cam would lock up. And I've run into this quite a bit lately, and I only use one cam manufacturer as a rule, unless, you know, it's a higher end build, they get a scat cam here. And, uh, you know, if it's a higher end build, they'll get a webcam, and if it's a real high end build, they usually have somebody grind a cam for it. So uh, this is pretty much my off-the-shelf go-to uh, brand. Well, I put the cam in there, and I kept fighting it and fighting it, and finally I uh, broke the micrometer out and I measured the cam, and the cam was ten thousandths too big. The journals, the bearing journals, were too big. So yeah, they were too large. Had to turn the cam down to uh, get it to turn in the case and have clearance on the cam bearings. That was my issue. So you shouldn't have to turn the uh, cam journals down to uh, fit the case. And my customer was asking me if I was going to send it back, and I'm like, no, 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 we have to put it on the lathe and you know, do it ourselves. But uh, yeah, I had to do that to get this baby to turn in here, and uh, it spins really nice now on the sixth assembly. I was successful. So I'm just uh, double checking my thrust, making sure everything's good there, and then we'll move on to uh, assembly of the short block later today. I gotta take the uh, engine block back outside, clean it, and uh, soap and water it one more time now that I've ground on it and cut it and you know all the stuff that I was doing to make the cam turn. I even made a little tool to uh, drive the camshaft, you know. Uh, to get it to spin, you know, I was trying to find the tight spot in it, and uh, you know, I was banging my head. I would have never thought the cam would be too big, but uh, that's why I've run into this problem a couple times now, you know, and I find myself going through bearings and trying to change the bearings out and make shit work. But come to find out, it's just you know, it's the supply quality, you know. You know. I don't know if they're just running out of stuff and they're, you know, boxing stuff up they would normally sell at a flea market or, you know, out the back door, but it's uh, something you need to check, you know, it's something that, you know, it's happening. And uh, I think a lot of people out there, they put the stuff together and if it's tight, you know, they just say, hey man, it'll clearance itself and it won't, you know, you got to have the... You need at least two, two and a half thousandths, you know, three thousandths for the oil to get between the bearing and the camshaft or it's not going to oil the motor properly. So that's where we're at with this bad boy. Uh, like I said, the lifter bores are a little, uh, a little loose on this side of the motor. Uh, this motor has been through a warm back, so. We're going to uh, do what we can. Hopefully it uh, isn't a rattler. And if it is, I won't be able to live with it. So, but it is what it is. You know, the gauges don't lie. The one case over there, and it seems to the wear is so even, too. It's so weird. You know, it's pretty consistent bore to bore. This is always hard to do with one hand. So anyway, we take the uh, measurement off the bore, and we put this on the uh, micrometer here, and then we go over to the lifter and measure it, and you get your clearance number. Too bad. Got a little draggy. 
think we'll get away with it. It's not like, you know, real sweet. It's not as bad as it was. So, you know, I think it'll live. And that's the main thing. I got to get oiled all the bearings and everything was so pinched off in this motor. It had no clearance. And uh, they were running synthetic oil in this motor. You know, they lost two crankshafts. So I don't really, uh, I'm not gonna get into the synthetic oil argument with air-cooled motors, but I don't think it's a good idea uh, for several reasons. But the main one being that synthetic oil is designed for the oil not to get hot. And when the oil doesn't uh, soak heat up in an air-cooled motor and take it to the oil cooler, uh, you, uh, the, t the cylinder head temperature goes up and the aluminum parts get hotter because the oil's not driving the heat off of them and taking it to the cooler. Now I know that uh, they make some motorcycle oil, synthetic. It might be closer engineered for an air-cooled engine. Uh, completely different scenario when you have water cooling the combustion chamber and the engine with synthetic oil, then you know you're not so concerned about oil cooling the engine. But in a Volkswagen motor, uh, people refer to them as air-cooled, but they are also oil-cooled. That's why they have an oil cooler on them, and the oil traps the heat, pulls the heat off the parts, goes to the cooler, the fan blows over it, pulls the heat somewhat out of the oil, and then it returns to the motor. So that, in effect, is an oil-cooled engine. And uh, when the oil cannot trap the heat off the parts, then you have parts failure. Uh, cylinder head temperature usually goes through the roof. This car did not have a cylinder head temperature gauge on it. It will now. So, you know, we can monitor the oil temperature and the cylinder head temperature. And once you have those two gauges in your car, then you can make an informed decision on whether synthetic oil is right for you when you can monitor your oil temperature and your cylinder head temperature and see if they both go up or down when you change over to synthetic. More than likely, you're gonna see an increase in the cylinder head temperature and a decrease in the oil temperature. And uh, that's not what you want in the Volkswagen. You know, cylinder head life is the life of the motor. Uh, it's the tune of the engine. If your cylinder head is 500 degrees out there, you know, it's uh, very hard to uh, tune that and make a good mixture happen in the combustion chamber, you know. So getting the cylinder head temperature under control is like one of the keys to engine life on a Volkswagen. So that's why I always tell people, I would say the cylinder head temperature gauge is probably one of the most critical gauges on a Volkswagen. But anyway, I don't know how we got down that road, but it's, uh, we're there. And, uh, I'm about ready to assemble this. There's a couple spots on the deck that don't look really great. But like I said, this is the better out of the two evils. So, if anybody out there has got a line on some lifter bushings, you know, uh, hit me up. I'd like to get some of those and try to bush a case. I've got some, I've got a case here that's no good, so I can set it up on the uh, drill press and see if that's something I can do or if it's going to have to go out and be put on a mill. But uh, yeah, I think that's uh, one of the areas that a lot of cases are lacking in. The lifter bore seems to be one of the areas that wear. And I've noticed the new lifters seem to be quite a bit softer. Uh, the, the ones we took out of the, the motor that wiped the lifter bores out, they were, they were wiped and they were like bullets. Uh, they had worn down. And uh, when I put a new lifter in the lifter bore, you know the bore's still bad, but uh, considerably, not as sloppy as the original lifter, so I measured the lifter and it was worn almost a hundred thousandths. So it's uh, quite a bit of material off the lifter into the motor. All that metal's going through the bearings. And uh, you know, we had two failures, pretty similar. Both crankshafts failed. Uh, both Volkswagen set of rods and a uh, Chinese set of rods spun bearings. And uh, yeah. So we didn't do a whole video on that second motor and some of you guys were waiting for that, but you know, there's no sense kicking a dead horse, you know, I mean, it is what it is. A lot of the same, well, all the same mistakes were made, you know, zero deck on both motors. Uh, both motors had the 120 cam in it. Uh, both pistons, both motors had pistons hitting the heads and uh, 
the worst part about the uh, second motor, I guess, you know, besides all the parts being bad, was the customer just paid a considerable amount to have uh, copper rings, O-rings, put in the cylinder heads to attempt to lower the compression to combat the heat. Uh, you know, they had thought maybe the compression was too high at the end. And he paid the guy to uh, put the O-rings in, and they weren't in there either. So, you know, he took the car there, and the guy for the last hurrah charged him to uh, pull the motor out, uh, remove the cylinder heads, all the tin off the motor, install the copper gaskets, and they were not installed. And to add insult to injury, the customer actually bought the copper gaskets and took them down there. So, yeah. So those are there somewhere. But anyway, I'm going to take this out and give it a clean up. Hope you guys are having a good Labor Day. Get out there and do some labor. And I think that's what it is. Is it Labor Day? I don't know if you keep track of holidays anymore. You know, my brain's full of Volkswagen stuff. That's about all I remember. So anyway, uh, thank you again to you guys out there that bought motors, uh, sold three motors this weekend. And uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, it helps me out a bunch and uh, I'm going to try to put some more together. I have another 1600 that I'll be building and I have a 40 horse pretty much complete uh, that I'm going to build. Uh, paint all the sheet metal, it'll be a complete engine. Probably less the generator because uh, a 6 volt generator is pretty pricey. I do have the core but I'm not going to go out and buy that. The uh, piston cylinders are, you know, a hard enough pill to swallow. I think they're 300, 300 bucks, 300, 400 dollars. But anyway, it'll be a nice little build. Uh, some of those little motors, people really like them. I have another uh, single relief uh, 1600 short block over there. I need to finish that up. I have some uh, single port heads I need to do. And uh, yeah, I got to get the glass changed in the glass beater today. And I got a couple heads to blast. I have the valve job, the heads for this motor. Put some valve guides in it and uh, all that good stuff. And then I have some cylinder heads I need to get blasted for the motors that we're going to be building. So, so again, thank you for you guys that responded to the motor ads and uh, bought engines. Uh, the one motor is going to be local. The other motor went over to uh, Brooksville. So uh, I still have the uh, little 1600 here on the floor. We're going to upgrade it with some solid shaft rockers, uh, heavy duty oil pump, and a heavy duty gland nut, and I'm going to paint the sheet metal, and we're going to make that one run. That's another thing, if you're going to build motors for people, you sort of have to assume that the motor is never finished until the car is tuned and going down the road, because if you build the best motor in the world and it's not tuned properly, it's going to fail. So uh, if you're just out there to build motors, this guy got charged 800 bucks to uh, put his uh, 40s on and uh, jet them. And uh, I mean, I don't want to tell people what they should be charging, but if you uh, charge somebody $5,000 to build a used motor, then I, I would think that, you know, setting up the carburetors and jetting them should be part of that. Uh, you know, initial transaction at that price level. Because uh, this should have been a brand new motor at that price level, to be perfectly honest. Uh, you know, uh, I don't think there's ever been a motor here, uh, you know, at that price level that didn't leave with a brand new case and all new components. Uh, this, this was one of the worst things I've seen, so. But anyway, like I said, I hope you guys are having a great day. And uh, I also have this, uh, nobody watches to the end, so I figured I'd put it in here. I have that 2110, it's all brand new stuff. And I think I'm gonna be letting that go. I can sell it with the carburetors. It has Redline 48s with it. It has an inch and three quarter uh, merge exhaust that is coated, but has gotten a little rusty. So, you know, I'm gonna have to discount some of the stuff on it, I, I'm aware. It has Potter rockers, small piston cylinders, a set of wedge ports, CNC ported heads, uh, matching intake manifolds, uh, three quart sump, uh, scat rods, uh, empty crank, early empty crank, 
the aluminum case, a uh, good gland nut and washer, uh, and I say potter rockers, mat and push rods, new oil cooler, and uh, I have all the sheet metal and stuff for it. I think that motor's going to be right about in the uh, $8,000 range if somebody's interested in something like that. It could be cheaper with no carburetors and no exhaust. And then I could also uh, do a camshaft change on it because right now it has a, I think it's 600, 608 lift. It's pretty, uh, pretty, pretty peppy. It's more of a, uh, you know, weekend go race some Mustang motors, you know, and a little, if you had a close box train in a mount to that or mate to it, it would be a killer little street combination. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and shut this off. Hopefully this recorded. And uh, we talked about the cam bearings and using the old pump plate here. And hopefully that, that helps some people when they're trying to uh, measure their end plate on their camshaft. A little simple thing that you probably have laying around. And uh, we talked about the cam being too big and the uh, you know issues with that. So, yeah, check everything and uh, start with the camshaft.